Booker T. Washington was an African-American Southerner educator who came up from slavery in Virginia. After the Civil War, his family moved to West Virginia. With a desire to get an education, Booker T. Washington taught himself how to read, write, and spell. He eventually went to Hampton Institute in Virginia, where he was trained to be a teacher and was sent out to create a school in the South for Negroes, which was Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. The focus was to train teachers as well as to train students in agriculture and industrial education so they can go out and possibly start their own business and build and own property. During the time of Reconstruction, the Jim Crow laws were approaching. Even though Booker T. Washington was against segregation, he viewed that as an opportunity to work on ourselves, meaning the black community, and gradually advance their conditions and get blacks into the labor force. This concept is called gradualism. The reasoning for this view was that he understood that African Americans and the so-called white people in the same classroom could be problematic and, in a way, demoralizing because the African American culture, whether in education or economics, was still premature and had to start at step one. However, after African Americans proved their worth to society and to their own selves, along with the bitterness of the Civil War and Reconstruction dying out through time, then full rights would be granted to African Americans. Another point to take this approach was racial reconciliation, for there was much tension in America between blacks and the so-called white man, and North and South. Booker T. Washington's school of thought was popular during the late 1800s and early 1900s, when Booker T. Washington gave his famous speech called the Atlanta Compromise Exposition. He emphasized this, In all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hands and all things essential to mutual progress. Concerning racial reconciliation in the speech, he also mentions, To those of my race who depend on bettering their conditions in a foreign land, or who underestimates the importance of preserving friendly relations with the southern white man, who is their next-door neighbor, I would say, Cast down your buckets where you are. Cast it down and make it friends in the every manly way of the people of all races by whom you are surrounded. To those of the white race who look to the incoming of those of foreign birth and strange tongue and habits for the prosperity of the South, where I permit it, I will repeat what I have said to my own race. Cast down your buckets where you are. Cast it down among the eight million of Negroes whose habits you know, whose fidelity and love you have tested in days when to have proved treacherous meant the ruin of your fireside. Cast down your buckets among these people who have without strikes and labors, wars tilled your fields, cleared your forests, builded your railroads and cities, brought forth treasures from the bowls of the earth just to make possible this magnificent representation of the progress of the South. Of course, he had critics and was attacked relentlessly, mainly from the Northern Blacks, specifically W.E.B. Du Bois. And I know people pronounce it Du Bois, but I like to say Du Bois, whom he attacked and thought that Booker T's Washington's approach was pretty much accepting second-class citizenship. Nonetheless, Booker T. Washington's philosophy improved the lives of many blacks in America, especially in the South. Marcus Garvey is a Pan-Africanist or a black nationalist from the poorer parts of Jamaica, i.e. he was not a black American. He created the Universal Negro Improvement Association, or the UNIA, which promoted racial pride, economic self-sufficiency, and the formation of an independent black nation in Africa, which is where we get the Let's Go Back to Africa movement, or black separatism. Believe it or not, he bought a ship called the Black Star Line Ship 
that helped distribute his weekly newspaper called the Negro World. His philosophy appealed to poor black communities, especially in Harlem, New York, which seems like the hub of black radical politics. His philosophy also showed that the white man was the issue for the black community's pitfalls and encouraged separatism with the black superiority doctrine. For example, he states, The black skin is not a badge of shame, but rather a glorious symbol of national greatness. Another example, he states, The white man has succeeded in subduing the world by forcing everybody to think his way. The white man's propaganda has made him the master of the world, and all those who have come in contact with it and accepted it have become his slaves. Despite his radical and racial purist views, he stressed the importance of black people being independent of their race. He quotes, A race that is solely dependent upon another for economic existence sooner or later dies. As we have in the past been living upon the mercies shown by others and by the chances obtainable and have suffered therefrom, so we will in the future suffer if an effort is not made now to adjust our own affairs. We are going to emancipate ourselves from our mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. Mind is your only ruler, sovereign. The man who is not able to develop and use his mind is bound to be the slave of the other man who uses his mind. Garvey's popularity and philosophy competed hard with Du Bois' philosophy after the death of Booker T. Washington in 1915. He also openly denounced W.E.B. Du Bois and the NAACP for making them dependent on the white man and begging whites to love and accept them as equals. Garvey's influence declined rapidly when he and other UNIA members were indicted for mail fraud in 1922, connected with the sale of stock for the Black Star Line. He served two years of a five-year prison term, but in 1927, uh, USA President Calvin Coolidge deported him as an undesirable alien. He was never able to revive the movement abroad, and he died in virtual obscurity. W.E.B. Du Bois, or Du Bois, was a quote-unquote civil rights or Marxist leader. Born in a free family in Massachusetts, he was a very bright young man and had great support from his own community. So much so that his church and community raised money to go to college at Fisk University and later become the first Negro to get his Ph.D. from Harvard University. He founded the magazine The Crisis and also the NAACP in 1909. So he may work with the white liberals to integrate the black American community and fight for full political civil rights for the black Americans. Du Bois famously declared, The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa in America and the islands of the sea. Du Bois and Garvey agreed on the problem, but not the solution. Du Bois argued, henceforth, the destiny of the race could be conceived as leading neither to assimilation nor separatism, but to proud, enduring hyphenation. Many concepts are traced to W.E.B. Du Bois. First, he led the Niagara Movement, which promoted the belief that social change could be accomplished only through agitation and protests. He states, Agitation is a necessary evil to tell of the ills of the sufferings. Without it, many a nation has been lulled to false security and preened itself with virtues it did not possess. The function of this association is to tell this nation the crying evil of race prejudice. It is a hard duty, but a necessary one, a divine one. It is pain. Pain is not good, but pain is necessary. Pain does not aggravate disease. Disease causes pain. Agitation does not mean aggravation. Aggravation 
calls for agitation in order that the remedy may be found. Another concept he pushed was the concept of the talented tenth. This concept of his emphasized the necessity for higher education to develop the leadership capacity among the ablest 10% of black Americans, which included W.E.B. Du Bois himself. This concept was also in response to Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Compromise because he feared that blacks would be internal second-class citizens. In Du Bois' goal to achieve political and equal rights, he stressed the importance of educating black American teachers, professional men, ministers, and spokesmen who would earn their special privileges by dedicating themselves to leavening the lump and inspiring the masses. In other words, be the black community spokespersons and become the black elites that many blacks can admire. In this role, he wielded an unequal influence among middle-class blacks and progressive whites as the propagandists for the black protests from 1910 until 1934. Just like Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois was on the FBI's watch. It was not because he was black like many simple-minded people think, but because of his severe communist ties. The NAACP was a communist front though Du Bois lied about it pretty much for most of his life. He only briefly joined the Socialist Party in 1912, but remained sympathetic to Marxist ideas throughout the rest of his life. He states, Today, alas, we all know better, and we see in Karl Marx a colossal genius of infinite sacrifice and monumental industry, and with a mind of extraordinary logical keenness and grasp from the Marxism and the Negro Problem essay. Under these circumstances, what shall we say of the Marxian philosophy and of its relation to the American Negro? We can only say, as it seems to me, the Marxian philosophy is a true diagnosis of the situation in Europe in the middle of the 19th century despite some of its logical difficulties but it must be modified in the United States of America and especially so far as the Negro group is concerned. The Negro is exploited to a degree that means poverty, crime, delinquency, and indigence. And that exploitation comes not from a black capitalistic class, but from the white capitalistic class and equally from the white proletariat. His only defense is such internal organization as will protect him from both parties and such practical economic insights as will prevent inside the race group any large development of capitalistic exploitation. The reformist program of socialism meets no response from the white proletariat because it offers no escape to wealth and no effective bar to black labor and a must sell of black labor is essential to white labor standard of living. The shrill cry of a few communism is not even listened to because and solely because it seeks to break down barriers between black and white. There is not at present the slightest indication that Marxian revolution based on a united class conscious proletariat is anywhere on the American far horizon. Rather, race antagonism and labor group rivalry is original, still undisturbed by word catastrophe. In the hearts of black laborers alone, therefore, lie those ideals of democracy in politics and industry, which may in time make the workers of the world effective dictators of civilization. He openly identified with pro-Soviet Russian causes. He was also awarded the Vladimir Lenin Peace Prize, yet still denied he was a communist at that time. He even visited Soviet Russia and even Mao Zedong, the mass murdering dictator of communist China. Because of all his friendly visits, this led to his indictment in 1951 as an unregistered agent for a foreign power. Although a federal judge directed his acquittal, the Bois had become sick and tired of the United States. After countless of times of being accused of being a communist and denying it in 1961, he publicly announced that he was a member of the Communist Party. That same year, 
He left the United States for Ghana, where he began work on the Encyclopedia Africana in earnest. However, it would never be completed, and where he later became a citizen and died there. Seemingly, revisionist historians will make it seem that both Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois feuded with Booker T. Washington, but it is the contrary. W.E.B. Du Bois disliked the philosophy of both Marcus Garvey and Booker T. Washington. While both Washington and Garvey did not seem too fond of Du Bois as well, Marcus Garvey was very open about his disapproval of Du Bois and the NAACP. At the same time, Booker T. Washington did not really openly comment or name Du Bois. However, he does describe the kind of class of people uh, black Americans and anybody should avoid. Booker T. Washington warns us in his book, My Larger Education, stating, There is another class of colored people who make a business of keeping the troubles, the wrongs, and the hardships of the Negro race before the public. Having learned that they are able to make a living out of their troubles, they have grown into the settled habit of advertising their wrongs, partly because they want sympathy and partly because it pays. Some of these people do not want the Negro to lose his grievances because they do not want to lose their jobs. This is the case with W.E.B. Du Bois, whom I call personally, in my opinion, the father of modern-day race hustling. He encouraged agitators and most likely indoctrinating the black youth during his teaching tenure at Atlanta University, now known as Clark Atlanta University. In Du Bois' uh, writing, he always talked about the system, slavery, oppression, and victimhood while making money off the plight of African Americans, people uh, via the NAACP, a communist front according to the FBI files, and most assuredly still is today. The philosophy Du Bois brought to the table makes crystal clear sense to anyone why he opposed Booker T. Washington. Washington was a Southern Christian, American, and the capitalists, which are the arch enemies of any Marxists. It should also be noted that Booker T. Washington was a Southerner and born into slavery, while W.E.B. Du Bois was a Yankee, quote-unquote, and born as a free man in a predominantly white community. For those who have a true understanding of American history, one can see two cultural differences from the quote-unquote Yankee point of view and the Southerner point of view. While Washington's view was to make the best out of an unfortunate situation and gradually build the African-American community into gaining and earning their civil rights fully, the Bois believed that economic gains were not secure unless there was political power to safeguard them. This is shown in this comment from the Bois regarding Booker T. Washington. He is striving nobly to make Negro artisan businessmen and property owners, but it is utterly impossible under modern competitive methods for working men and property owners to defend their rights and exist without the right of suffrage. On the other hand, Washington felt that Du Bois' militant agitation did more harm than good and served only to irritate Southern whites. He quotes, I think though that the opportunity to freely exercise such political rights will not come in any large degree through outside or artificial forcing. Marcus Garvey did not like W.E.B. Du Bois' philosophy despite both being Pan-Africanists. Marcus Garvey wanted blacks to separate themselves from the whites and deemed W.E.B. Du Bois' progressive ideologues nothing but making black people beg for the white man to hug them which I personally can't agree with because most of the black liberals today only fight for the right for them to get a hug and a kiss on the cheek from the liberal whites. Anyway, the boys described Garvey as a quote-unquote a little fat black man, ugly but with a intelligent eye and a big head. As a rebuttal, Garvey styled the boys as a quote, a little Dutch, a little French, a little Negro, a mulatto, a monstrosity. <laughs> oh boy. So we can see that they had a beef with each other that seemingly got petty and childish in sometimes. 
concerning the relationship between Booker T. Washington and Marcus Garvey, their relationship was pretty well. Marcus Garvey, to my surprise, admired and respected Booker T. Washington. They both sent letters to each other in hopes to collaborate. However, Booker T. Washington did pass away before they could meet. An excerpt from one of the letters to Booker T. Washington from Marcus Garvey on September 8, 1914, Garvey states, I have been keeping in touch with your good work in America, and although there is a differences of opinion on the lines of which the Negro should develop himself, yet the fair-minded critic cannot fail in admiring your noble efforts. The two schools of America have gone as far as to give us, who are outside, the world possibilities of the industrial and intellectual scope for Negro energy. We are organized out here on broad lines, and we find it conclusive to our interest to pave our way both industrially and intellectually. Here we see that Marcus Garvey had great respect for Mr. Washington, even if they had different opinions on other viewpoints. Moreover, that should be something one should note. Booker T. Washington was respected by one and disliked by the other, as well as Garvey was respected by one, Booker T. Washington, and disliked by the other. In contrast, W.E.B. Du Bois was disliked by both, with Washington not mentioning him personally. That should raise particular concerns for those who follow the philosophies of W.E.B. Du Bois. Now the question I pose is, out of the three black leaders at the time, whose philosophy conquered the quote-unquote black American culture? First, I believe that the philosophy of Booker T. Washington is the most beneficial for the so-called black community. There are glaring flaws in the philosophies of both W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey's. First, Marcus Garvey's push of black people remaining separate from whites and independent in order to build their own community is a good thing. Uh, however, the flaw of Marcus Garvey is that he is not an American and believes in a black globalist or black nationalist ideal. I, for one, am not a nationalist of any sort, nor a black nationalist, mainly because history shows that nationalism is cancerous and cannot be accomplished without the suffering of those who are not on board. Another issue is that many so-called black people today have this mindset that all people of African ancestry are the same. Unfortunately, that is a very shallow and two-dimensional way to think, uh, because what separates society is not solely the shade of a group's skin, but its culture. If one groups the so-called white Europeans as just quote-unquote white, then one is missing that even on the continent of Europe, Germans and Polish people are very different from each other. Their history, both cultural and political, tends to differ from each other, as well as their language. One can find the differences uh, on the African continent between neighboring tribes and even in China between the Han Chinese and those who speak Cantonese. In America, the southern culture is very different from the northern states. The city dwellers are very different from both uh, culturally and historically in many ways from the rural communities, or how we like to call them country folks, or rednecks. This concept also goes for the so-called black communities, which may include uh, black hood folks versus rural black folks. Uh, they have religion, plays a factor in differences in groups of people. Uh, you have the Hoteps, you have the black Hebrews, and then you have the black Christians. And even between the black Christians, you have a divide there. And of course, you got the Nation of Islam. See, today, many African immigrants tend to despise African Americans, mainly because of the ignorance many uh, so-called black people in America have about the African culture, as well as how African Americans tend to act culturally in America versus the mindset of the Africans uh, that immigrate uh, to America. Uh, these examples reveal the significant flaws in the philosophy of Marcus Garvey. He did not have a deeper understanding of the culture in America. 
it is similar to how uh, you have a lot of these Canadians in the liberal media or even in the conservative media trying to tell Americans how they should live their lives and the Americans trying to tell certain countries how they should run their government. Trying to force people to do what your culture does will only lead to chaos and confusion because of the ability to not think about individual cultures and not understanding that not everyone wants to be like thee or have the same culture as thee. Lastly, the concept of pride, or in this case, black pride, is always an idea that leads a culture down to the crooked path. For pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before the fall. The flaw of W.E.B. Du Bois is that, one, he was a Marxist. In modern America, Marxism is not a scary word for many today, especially in the indoctrination camps we call schools. But uh, Marxism is a failed and morally evil philosophy. First, Marxism has never, let me repeat that, never worked in any country that implemented it. It always led to the destruction of culture, history, religion, freedom, and people. Marxist ideas, whether it be communism or socialism, always gives the government full control of everything, and 10 times out of 10 leads to a dictatorship, i.e. Joseph Stalin, Lenin, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, Adolf Hitler, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara. We can keep going down this list. Furthermore, it should concern that W.E.B. Du Bois was awarded by the Soviet Union and even met with Chairman Mao Zedong, who accounted for the worst mass killings in the 20th century. Hitler nor King Kong had nothing on Mao Zedong. W.E.B. Du Bois also believed that agitating is the best way to get things done. He compares the agitation to a symptom of a disease. However, he gets it wrong because agitation only causes more attention. If one has a scab that needs to heal, one should allow it to heal naturally. However, if one agitates that scab, then that scab will lead to an infection. That could have been avoided if one just let that scab heal naturally. He was also too deep into making and leading political movements, then adding a plethora of other philosophies into the movements, which only cooked up chaos and confusion. The point of Booker T. Washington urging black folks not to get way too caught up with politics is because when you have a more or less ignorant group of people who are catching up with modern society and culture, they could easily be swayed with different and new doctrines. As a result, it may sway one from the truth, logic, and beneficial knowledge to better oneself. This approach is reiterated in the New Testament, quote, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. One sees this with W.E.B. Du Bois. He went from socialist to finally just embracing full-on Marxism with mixing doctrines of Pan-Africanism. However, Du Bois dismissed religion, especially Christianity as a whole, stating, When I became head of a department at Atlanta, the engagement was held up because, again, I bought at Leiden in prayer. I flatly refused to join any church or sign any church creed. I think the greatest gift of the Soviet Union to modern civilization was the dethronement of the clergy and the refusal to let religion be taught in public schools. Proof that he was an atheist or how he calls himself a quote-unquote free thinker. But whenever you deal with people that call themselves a free thinker, that all that really means is that the truth does not really matter. See, if one finds a strategy that makes the feels unique, even if that strategy will lead to the destruction of thousands of people, it does not matter because I am my own God and this is my truth, which is the approach of spoiled, ungrateful, and brute children act. However, the question is not who is better, but whose philosophy conquered the quote-unquote, black American communities culture. 
The philosophy of Booker T. Washington is probably the silent minority in the African American community because his philosophy is one not prideful, nor did it have an overemphasis of civil rights. Washington's philosophy focused on owning property uh, and owning businesses, learning a trade in skills, loving your neighbor, even the white man, and to work one's way up without making all the excuses in the world. See, a mindset like this, you know, pull yourself by the bootstraps, a mindset like this will get a black man called a coon, an Uncle Tom, a house negro, a slave, a house slave, or a traitor to your race, even though the gangsters are never called a coon. Marcus Garvey's philosophy could be easily the winner since so many so-called black people have ingrained in the worldview that black in America and in Africa and around the world is beautiful. The black woman is God and that black people are the purest and superior over other races. However, this viewpoint is either mixed in with the mainline culture of African Americans, but mainly found in certain sects of the African American communities, which consist of, you know, the Hoteps, the black Hebrews, the Nation of Islam, I mean, again, you you can say yes. Um, I I believe that Garvey's um, philosophy has come to a renaissance in recent years. However, it's more of they finally just embraced it, but it has never truly conquered the majority of the black community. Nevertheless, stop here and imagine this. Today... Whenever African Americans feel there is an issue or an injustice, the first solution is what? Protesting. Furthermore, if the protesting does not work, then what else happens? Then agitation will be the next option. Well, usually the agitation has already started before the protesting. But ultimately, if it were not for W.E.B. Du Bois or Du Bois, Perhaps there would have never been a Martin Luther King leading the civil rights movement with the same philosophies the boys encourage protesting, agitation, and the emphasis on full civil rights. Without the boys' philosophy of protest and agitation and full civil rights in politics, perhaps there would have never been the Black Lives Matter organization or the Black Panther Party. That is where the mainline culture of the quote-unquote black American community relies. Protesting their problems, agitating their wounds, voting and thinking politically left to very far left <clears throat> Marxists, yet have black pride while hating whom they love, who are most likely the liberal whites, which is nothing but a mere cry for the liberal whites to love and accept them. Uh, forgive me if those statements seem harsh, but... It's just what I had always seen since I was a child when I went to my historical black college as an undergrad and even on the news in 2020. All the tactics of pushing for civil rights and reminding black people about the past and protesting and agitation all comes from W.E.B. Du Bois's school of thought. Sadly, how has this helped the black culture. The foundation of Du Bois's school of thought is based in Marxism, which was based on Luciferian principles. Even more, proof that Du Bois's philosophy conquered the African American community is that most people have no idea how Washington's ideas improved the lives of so many African Americans in the late 1800s and early 1900s. That is because in most schools today, they will briefly touch on Washington's uh, most of the time in the viewpoint of W.E.B. Du Bois and the NAACP and other leftist ideas. They have successfully destroyed Washington's character and his influence. Like Du Bois siding with the atheists 
Communist Party stance on religion, many African Americans today may be spiritual, but have ultimately turned their backs to the Most High, the Bible, which is what Marxism wants. Du Bois' philosophy has contributed to the downfall of the African American culture, or lack thereof. More than ever, African Americans have been indoctrinated with Du Bois' and Marx's ideologies for generations, and now he has produced. The fruit his philosophy produced is being lovers of themselves more than lovers of others, i.e. the black pride and how we see many African Americans defend other African Americans even when the truth shows that their people are in the wrong. It doesn't matter to them. They are riotous in the day or night, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, speaking evil of things that they understand not, despisers of those that are good, perishing in their own corruption, lustful, despisers of government, yet receiving the reward of unrighteousness, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. The mere focus of gaining power, even if it costs them their souls. The fruit of chaos is what was produced in the black American community with the boys' school of thought leading the way.